Start new business 3A is going to be pulled from the agenda, so we will not be discussing that conditional use permit. Um, I will turn it over to Member Soini, the chair of the planning board, for the adoption of the minutes, and then we will, I guess from there, go straight into the zoning ordinance. New business B, the sale of THC products, is a council issue that we'll discuss uh, after the planning business concludes. You all are welcome to stick around for that if you want. Otherwise, uh, I figured we'd deal with that on our own. Gee. And I just need uh, an approval for the minutes from the May 16th planning board meeting and council meeting. I'll make a motion. <laughs> is there a second? Awesome. All right. A motion by Josh and a second by Randy to approve those minutes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Minutes are approved. This time going into the zoning ordinance. The reason this is back is the council had a public hearing on the ordinance. Pat Flanders was here who, uh, oh gosh, spent the better part of an hour and a half, I think it was, talking to us about uh, what he had as far as concerns and things like that. Uh, some of them were things I think that we talked about, but others the council decided warranted further discussion by this group. Uh, so we invited ourselves to join you. Um, there's the list there. I don't know, Jennifer, if it's easiest for you to walk us through some of the changes you made. Um, so um, based on, I just had um, cut and paste the public hearing minutes. Um, page one, he addresses um, to add fees throughout the ordinance. That is typically not something that we do. The fees are adopted by resolution. Otherwise, every time that you would adopt a new fee, you have to amend the ordinance. Yeah. So we'd like to just keep that resolutions adopt fees, ordinances adopt <coughs> proposed regulation. So that addresses that. On page two, um, he he thought there was a conflict um, page, uh, with number three with page 14. It addresses variances. So what we're going to propose is to add on number three, on page two, um, after the word deny, C section 3655 actually addresses variances. So people can see that on page two and go right to section 3655 where it addresses the variances. Okay. So this makes it a little bit more clear um, for the person that's using the ordinance. Then we're going to skip over to um, page six, um, the whole bluff definition, um, he, he had indicated that the word bluff was defined differently than Stearns County. It is, but it is the um, definition from Park Reader on DNR. So we're going to go with the DNR definition. Um, skipping over to page 21, under funeral home, so just to clarify, you're talking 21 of the agenda packet. 21 of the agenda packet, yes, sorry about that. Yeah. I'm going in between now. <clears throat> um, under a funeral home, it says, a funeral home shall not include facilities for cremation unless allowed by a conditional use. And he asked why. Um, we feel that if there's going to be a crematorium in there, there's extra things that are needed for that. And there might be emissions. Um, it's just a different process of um, you know, preparing the dead, so um, we would like it to stay as a conditional use, whether it be smells or smokes or, I don't know, but unless somebody else wants to say it differently. Does it make sense for us to put in language like that, um, unless allowed by a conditional use permit to, effect, um, to address environmental concerns such as smell or smoke, things like that? That way people know what is being looked at. I, I think smoke, dust, smell, those are things that you address in a conditional use permit. I mean, if you look at what a conditional use permit is, you know, what kinds of things you would address, it's, it's in there. But you could say, I mean, we could do a reference there to the conditional use permit language of, of, of the zoning okay. ordinance if we wanted to, I suppose it would be, you know, then it'd be consistent with what we did above where we referred to the variance section. But, but we don't but we don't do that every place else that something has a conditional use permit we don't i mean because there's a lot of things that require a conditional use permit we don't put that reference there so i don't know if it 
really makes sense to do that. Okay. I'm fine with it. Okay. So skipping over to page 10 or 22 of the packet, um, he had questioned under permissible home occupations, this is the very middle paragraph under the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. He questioned why we limit three peoples. Well, it's just a relative number. You can pick any number from 1 to 100 or whatever. But we arbitrarily picked three. We thought three different cars, three different families. Um, we have to be respectful that this is going to happen in a residential district. Um, we talk about traffic and parking and things like that. So we pick three, but it could be two, or it could be five, it could be four. Um, what number is that under? It's on page 10 of the ordinance or 22 of the packet. Yeah. It is the very middle paragraph, and it starts with the word permissible. I was looking at the numbers. That's I okay. Couldn't find it there. So at the very last um, <laughs> sentence of that, it says other instruction limited to three pupils at a time. He questioned why three. Is this a number we've had in the books? But it could be five, ten, two, four. This is for people that have businesses in their home. Yeah, so this would be like something typical for us. You, you would have a, you like, I'm just going to say, um, Mrs. Zimmerman, she taught piano lessons on Hudson Street for years yep. to come to her home. You know, and, but usually when you're giving lessons, it's from like 3 to 5 or 5 to 7, and people are coming and going. It just would be this big gathering of cars. I'm fine with keeping it to 3, no I like that. Most of these things wouldn't take more than 3 in it. Yeah, if we need to change it in the future, if there's a problem, we can look at it. Uh, but for right now, let's leave it. Um, moving to page 14 or page 26 of the agenda, you'll see some red line items there. Um, he questioned the um, term for um, short term rentals. Um, we cleaned it up by taking out the word unit and we expanded the definition to make it more clear that the short term rental was not to be used for a small conference center, a retreat center, um, events, something like that. It was more like an Airbnb where you'd stay there instead of a hotel room, and then you would, you know, you'd tour the city of Painton and you would leave when you're done. Unless you just see that short term rental being something different. Fine with me. Okay. Um, on page 15 is our current. I'm going to step in here. What uh, what are other things that would be cons considering short term rental? A vacation home. I mean, yeah. Well, I think this this covers like your um, bed in bed and breakfast maybe or your well, you know bed and breakfast is addressed separately, but your Airbnbs or VRBOs. But typically, you, for you to stay there, um, this is saying you can stay there. You just can't have a big hoopla. What would, how would we define a commercial or a social event? What would that mean? So if you're staying there and you're staying there like with, because I like last fall I went somewhere with my friends, we stayed in you know an Airbnb. How do, what are we, what is a social event? Or is that defined somewhere or what does that mean? What are we trying to prevent, I guess, is my question. <coughs> I'd say it would be like having your wedding there. Okay. I mean, that would be an event, I don't know. I think the things we're trying to prevent is like, parking issue, okay. loud noises, um, nuisance, things like that. Now, I think if you and four other girls were there and you were playing trivia right. and had wine tasting, yeah. I think that is a permissible event. It's just not this um, big gathering of maybe invited guests. Okay. Um, Unless we see that differently, this I, would be the yeah. time to change that. I just wonder if maybe we should clarify that somehow, like if, you know, because it's, it's just kind of vague to me. Maybe it isn't to other people. I don't know. It's been a long day. I guess I don't see it as vague, but now that you bring it, now that you point it out, I guess I don't know that I agree necessarily with the social events restriction. Uh, I mean, for my cousin's wedding, we went to New Mexico and stayed in a house, and yeah. I think there were 12 of us in there, but it was a six bedroom house. Uh, so if the parking coincides with the parking, or if as many cars are there as are allowed to be there as far as the parking ordinance goes? think that that would probably satisfy that issue. I'm wondering if we don't just change it to use of a short-term rental dwelling for any commercial, such as small conference center, private retreat center, et cetera, is prohibited. Uh, so then we leave it. Short-term rentals are only permitted for residential uses. Yep. We get rid of the 
that we leave in the commercial. Because it is usually social. I mean, we did two for a family reunion. There was like six, six or eight of us. Yeah, then you have to keep defining it, what it is. So I yeah. think it's a better idea. Yeah, so maybe we define, define like bed and breakfast type. That's in another area, though. Bed and breakfast is already in another area. Okay, so does this uh, prevent or allow any houses that are being used for drug rehab? For what? Drug rehab? It's not part, no, it's not part of this. No. That's not, yeah, that's not a sure. That's a different type of living. Those are addressed, Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, they're in the provisions of our ordinances that limit unrelated individuals residing together. Yep, correct. Uh, and then at least one of those properties has a conditional use permit allowing a greater number than what's typically set for I assume it was a variance, but I can't remember honestly. I think it was probably a variance. I think, yeah, it might have been. So bed and breakfast, um, to answer Katie's question, we have defined on page six of the ordinance or 18 of the packet. And is residence means, bed and breakfast residence means an owner occupied single family residence that provides lodging and meals to registered guests. Um, so, Sean, can you just repeat that last sentence? What do you like that to say when it starts with the word use? Use of a short-term rental dwelling for any commercial events, parentheses, such as a small conference center, private retreat center, etc. cetera, close parentheses, is prohibited, period. Thank just you. Check out social events. Okay. I guess, is there any disagreement to that? Does it, does it make sense to leave that it's only for residential purposes? I think it does. Yeah, okay. So I, I, I had the sense you were taking that out, but I think it makes sense to leave that in, that it's only for residential. Neil, do you need a copy of the ordinance? Yeah, that would be good. Um, did I get one? I don't think I did. Well, I got one in the mail yesterday, or Saturday. So the one here that says Neil on it? Uh, I was going to wing it, but it's okay. So we were just leaving page 26 of the packet there. Okay. Um, I think we go to 15. So 15, um, he asked to have the parking and loading requirements elevated. I would advise against that. Skipping over to page 31 of the packet or 19 of the ordinance. It was question on number seven, approved materials for fences. Um, so we added in the word concrete, but we are open if anybody else has any other ideas of what fences could be made of that we would like to allow. Art. Art. Well, it still has to be on some kind of a structure, though. Yeah, we want, we want to worry about the actual structure. We're trying to stay away from tires and pallets, barbed wire, uh, cattle panels. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I, those types of things, I, you know. Um, <coughs> snow fences. Where was that at? Chicken wire. Uh, it was on our list. I can think of yeah. one that's made from the wood that was in pellets, but it's no longer like yeah. a pellets, you know, it, yeah. it looks decent, but it's Mine is rabbit wire, because <coughs> I was there before and we didn't do it there, I guess I'm curious to, to Katie's question or suggestion for art, is there a way, I mean, Jennifer, we were talking before, this ordinance is only good as today. And a new fencing material could come out in two weeks, or somebody could have a very nice artistic creation that they want to put in. Is there a way to petition somehow to allow for a different use? I did see one downtown that does have, um, I think it was downtown. Um, it is a wood, and I think they're, um, it's, not, it's not cattle panels, but it's something, um, it is a panel of some sort. And those are pretty popular. And it, I mean, it looks fine. So I, I would be. So you want to do like a wire panel? 
by the cattle or hog cattle? I'm, I'm good with the way this is, but my fear with just saying something like art is that art, is, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And certain individuals who, like my father, think that garage door panels would make an excellent fence. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But if there's something that comes out, or if somebody has a great idea that we can all live with, can people apply for a conditional use permit to put up something unique? So actually, if, if you want to do something and it's not addressed in the ordinance, it's in zoning, it's a no, okay? We, 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 I would tell you no. However, you have the right to an ordinance amendment, and you can appeal for that. You can go through the process to have an ordinance amended <coughs> to allow <coughs> what you would like, like what we did for the cabinet shop. Mm -hmm. or, or they can come to planning and suggest to the planning board that it would make sense to revise the ordinance to include a material that's become popular or whatever. And, and planning could consider that, and planning could come forward with a proposed amendment to the ordinance as well. I mean, it, it can happen. Come on. As long as there's a process. I think yes. we should add the wire panels then because somebody has one downtown and it's nice. So, like a wire panel? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's. Where's the that, maybe? I can't, I can't remember where I saw it. But Most of the panels that you can buy a fleet, they're. Yeah, they're pretty, you know, they're solid. They're either, they're either six foot or four foot panels. That's how high they are. They're eight feet long. Yeah. So when the chicken ordinance does get passed, <laughs> this will cause a problem with anybody having chicken wire in their backyard. Oh, I get it. Yeah. Yep. I, don't, I don't think it would because it well, it's it, not a it wouldn't, it wouldn't well. be used as a being used as a fence. I mean, it would be for a for a for a chicken coop, I suppose, is what you're using it for. You're not using it for a for a fence for your property. Would it cause a problem though? If you use it as a fence for your property. No, I mean, the way this is worded, that would cause a problem with having a short chicken fence in your backyard. How do we define fence? In your I, I can't find it. What page it's on or anything. So a fence means any artificially constructed barrier of any approved material or combination of materials erected to enclose or screen areas of land. So my thought would be the chicken fence would be a fence because you're enclosing an area of land to keep your chickens in. But I could be... Or a rabbit, if there's rabbits that are going after your kitty. I mean, pigs, pop out pigs, goats, I mean, everybody wants the backyard. I mean, like if you have a fence around your garden to keep the rabbits out. Dog runs, things like that. Yeah, you do have those. A lot of people do it for. So maybe we want to add, like, chicken wire? Yeah. Uh, is, it, is it rabbit fencing or is it chicken wire or is it like garden fencing? What's a good term? Is there a way to just say what we don't want? <laughs> I, I think it works well. Leave it as it is. It encompasses just about everything somebody would want. And we've talked about the, prog or the process for somebody to apply for something else if they need to. But I think we should address something for around these gardens that already exist. Yeah, we should put in there it, that garden fencing is exempt or something like that. Or in, yeah, in the wire fencing that's already in, in evidence, the wire fencing. Well, people put in gardens and they want fences for rabbits, so I mean, mm -hmm. you have to yeah. allow for that. How about garden, garden, fence. Fence. garden fencing? Oh, no, because there's small dogs. So if I were to put a, a fence in my yard to keep my small dogs in, and my neighbor had a problem with it, they could call the police. It'd be a violation of this ordinance the way it's written now. Well, it depends on what you use. It depends on the material. Because those dog kennels are, you know, chain link or, which is an approved material. Well, my neighbor has one that is not yeah. like approved material right. under here, and it looks just fine. It's just white fence with some wire over it, like a dog one. But they're tiny dogs. So. What if we added a provision that the fencing 
restrictions do not apply for a fence less than 50 square feet or enclosing an area less than 50 square feet um, or shorter than like 24 inches in height. Or you could, you could just say um, that fences around gardens or as animal enclosures are exempt. Okay, there we go. And where would you put that? I would just put it at the end of parens seven. Okay. No objection for me. Nope, it sounds like it covers everything. Mm -hmm. Can we add the wire panels? Just to, I'm just nervous about the one that's already. Yeah. I think we could add wire panels. Okay. I don't. I don't know. I, the only thing I'm bothered about is I don't know what wire panel means. I don't. I either call a hot, hot either hot, 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 hot wire. They're either hot wire or hot panels. Wire, kind of almost welded to to the seam. If we, come up, if, we, if we could come up with a term that we know is, is the description of that fence, I'd feel more comfortable. I don't want to just say wire fences, but yeah. Because I did not have pictured in my head, Neil, what you just described. No, I didn't either. I'm a, with what you described, <laughs> whatever that's called. Cool. Well, that's a hog panel. Hog panel? Okay. And they're pretty, pretty heavy. Yeah. Yeah, they're becoming a lot more popular for. Um, but there's too much space. A hog panel mm -hmm. per se just mm -hmm. nailed to a wooden post or steel post, I don't think it's probably acceptable. I don't know. Well, there's but it's nailed to a wooden frame, maybe. Yeah, that's usually what people seem to be doing. So if we just add in a hog panel. Cattle panel, yeah. I mean, Cattle panel, that's, that's what they look like. I don't know. That's yep, that's what they are. Exactly. Yep. So is that what Megan's talking about, though? I don't know. I can't see it. <laughs> so it, they have it. Um, let me see. Yeah, they're kind of yeah. And but they are. Um, I've seen them. So yeah, see how they have this. Um, so we see it water painted. Yeah. Yeah. But see that one right there attached to the for the railing. So. I mean, I don't think that I, I can't see anyone looking at that and thinking that it is breaking any ordinance and that something's and wrong. And we already have those in town right now. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. But I just don't, you know, sometimes neighbors are petty. So. Okay. We will add that. Um, page 20. Um, Katie had brought this up early on in regards to lighting. We added um, a section in on lighting. There was some discussion in planning regarding the holiday lighting. Planning did not wish to change it, so it got to the public hearing and it was brought up again. So we added just some language that we should talk about on the top of page 21 or 33 of the packet. Um, we just put in some days. We can change it. It does not, it's just proposed language. Do we need to specify which holiday or what? No, no. Any, please don't. <laughs> yeah. Because people, you know, they decorate now for the Fourth of July and Halloween, Halloween. and yeah. Easter and every other holiday in between. So. Mm -hmm. well, I like the idea of number of days. Mm -hmm. And just to clarify, we're talking about display. So when I don't get my Christmas lights taken down right away, as long as they're not on, we're fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, as long as they're Is that a habit of yours? Well, some people live them up to your own. Yeah, they'll just keep going for all the different holidays. Okay, right below that, under emissions, around my Christmas um, it was noted that we should let MPCA handle it. Um, Bill and I have talked, and we believe that it should be addressed in our ordinance. Which part was that? Uh, emissions. Smoke, dust, yes. smoke, odors, noise. Okay. Um, in that same page, um, uh, we we put in a few um, grammatical things in paragraph number two, so that it would read better and more easily understandable. Um, 23, under public nuisances, um, it was noted that 
most of the ordinance could be um, probably a public nuisance and that the police department should just enforce it and our chief of police respectively declined. Hmm. Which one? Well, we, the comment was made that a lot of the ordinances that we have in zoning could just be a nuisance and that they could be enforced by the police department rather than the planning commission. And the police chief respectively declined. He would prefer to see the zoning ordinance state. Under public nuisances, Katie. It's on page uh, 23, number D. Yep. Um, Mr. Flanders made a comment on page 24 about um, something being redundant. We skipped over the temporary structures. Hey, can we step backwards to the uh, previous one about the junkyard? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to look up the definition of a junkyard because what could be considered a junkyard to one person may be considered a uh, renovation site for another. So is the junkyard uh, definition in here? I'll see it. Back in the day, it used to be a collection of inoperable cars. Um, junkyard is not defined. We should almost have a definition for junkyard then. <coughs> you would like one added? I think it would be a good idea. In the definitions? Just to clarify what is considered uh, a nuisance or junkyard, whatever. Well, um, business. well, Cain's Hill Auto used to be run by Nate Fields. It's called a salvage yard. And they have a conditional use to run that. So that's called a salvage yard. Now, I suppose the slang term or the other term for it would be a junkyard, but it, it is called a salvage yard, and they have a conditional use to run it. It's a collection of cars that don't run. I don't have my phone. I need to look that up, but probably. Case of all Jimmy Stanger would be considered. Could be, I mean, I, that, that was brought up. I mean, honestly, I've never looked. Um, the requirement would be that you completely enclose the fence if it was. He, uh, I know, I think he, he, kind of, he kind of almost is. I don't, I don't know that his fence really encloses it entirely. I've never really investigated, honestly. Um, the comment was the comment was made that, that his fence isn't very good, but I, I don't know. I mean, I, I I haven't looked or in a critical way at his property. I know I know he's got metal stuff there that he uses for welding, and you know I know it's part of his business, I guess most of it, but I, I don't know. Well, the last couple of years he has done a lot of scrapping. Yeah, so it's about a, a third of what it once was. And when Pat had a question about that too, he did specify stainer steel, but he missed the word or. Um, so he thought that it was a, it had to be enclosed within a building and a fence, not or. So he was thinking that, it, like at Stinger, that they were going to have to, you know, build a building around all this stuff, but that's not the case as long as they have a, so yeah, that's, I don't think that's in question anymore. And maybe he is working on, you know, um, lowering his inventory. Well, the price of steel's been good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, that also raises a question of how would the uh, classified, the apartment property be classified? I mean, then, could it be a junkyard? It kind of looks like it. But to them, they could just be storing their vehicles down there for future purposes. I'm not quite sure. I think that how many junk vehicles is a, is a junkyard is the question. Well, I mean, I think what, it's specifying a commercial use, right? Yeah, I mean, we're, if we're at a commercial use, I think it's different, but, you know, generally, uh, an unlicensed in inoperable motor vehicle is not allowed. I yeah. mean, you know, yeah. if, you, if you have a commercial use, obviously, if you're a, uh, you know, commercial business doing repairs or or using the metal for something else, I guess that's that's one thing. But if it was a residence, you, you can't you can't store yeah. unlicensed inoperable motor vehicles if they're not indoors. And that becomes under the nuisance ordinance. Right, which is a different section of our code. So I think the question then becomes, this goes back to something that Pat was bringing up, 
at what point does it become a zoning issue and what point does it cost into the nuisance ordinance? Um, are the junkyard salvage yards permitted as a conditional use permit in the C1 or C2 language? I think in I2 maybe, not, not in commercial. Well, I wasn't referring to Chelsea Arms property, I was Larry Arms. Right, right. Okay. Uh, making sure that was clear. It was to me. I guess I don't know about the rest anymore. <laughs> okay. Yep. Okay. Um, the reason why I'm wondering is if we're just talking about one business that's going to be sort of permitted in because of an, a pre-existing non-conforming use, do we need to have this discussion, or do we just leave it as it is? and know that all residential properties will be dealt with under the nuisance ordinance. So the, the only place a junkyard is permitted is as a conditional use in I-2. Okay. Good. Then I think it does probably make sense to have some sort of a definition in there on junkyard and clarifying that it has that commercial component to it of either junking cars or, or whatever it is. See, I think it involves more than just cars because uh, shield scrap, whatever, appliances, all kinds of machinery and equipment. Yeah. Non-operable machinery and equipment, I think, would be all part of that. <clears throat> okay. I'm good with that. Anyone else need more? Nope, that sounds good. Okay. Um, so that was page 23. Um, so we'll skip over to page um, 29 of the ordinance or 41 of your packet. Um, he made uh, just a couple comments regarding this page, and I think it was underneath the restoration standards. Um, does the comp plan cover it? Um, and also under the waiver, you know, be consistent with nuisances. Um, he just made general just statements. He didn't really ask for a change, but I wanted to make it known for those that didn't attend the public hearing. And we've we've never had a problem with that mining ordinance. It's not it hasn't commonly happened in town. I think uh, Voss um, pulled a, a mining permit for a while. When um, we developed that was a whole mining thing for that area over there. That's why that ordinance was in effect. Prior to that, we never even had it. We put a moratorium on it to make it until um, we got a ordinance drafted. Once the ordinance drafted, the was permitted and we, we did what they did and now it's ceased. So. Um, again on page 30 or page 42 of the ordinance uh, packet, underneath the word effect, um, he used the word redundant didn't really say anything more about it. Moving on to page 33 of the ordinance or 45 of the packet. I think there, if I can just go back, the redundancy for the signage was how it was, the different types were reiterated for each zoning area. And, um, and we did that purposely. Yep. And I think we explained it that night was our old zoning ordinance or what's currently on the books is extremely hard to follow. So if you are in C2 and you just want to know what the, the ordinance is for C2 signage, you have to look in like six different spots. That is not easy for, you know, um, the person that's applying, you <coughs> know it's easy for me to get that across to somebody that just wants one little single page on what they need to do. So we, we, um, we made it consistent in all, in all the divisions of the district. Um, continuing with signage on page 33 or 45 of the packet, he questioned the cost of the sign, and really, it, it, we don't need it, so we're going to take it out. It does not um, determine, the cost of the sign does not determine the cost of the permit. Um, then something that has come up um, periodically, and I'm asking for maybe this change, is we have a, quite a few signs that already exist in our city. The poles already exist, the structure already exists, and if they're changing out the sign from maybe a typical letter sign where they're out there putting up letters every week to maybe a digital sign, or they're going to go to a lit sign, 
I don't think we need to permit them. The structure's already there. They're just upgrading it. They're changing the copy. Um, the structure's already been permitted for height. Electricity is already there. Um, it's just one less permit that we have to try to issue. Yeah. That's a good idea. I think that should also be included in if they're going digital, that um, it should follow along the, the lines of certain times at night where it's so, um, right so, on or whatever. Yeah, so Those regulations are in there if you have a yep. sign. Yep. 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 So typically on the changeable copy signs or the digital signs, there is language in here on how frequently they can change. Also, the number of seconds. That's, um, and also we want them to make sure they're not um, duplicating any like traffic signals. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, if we, I always tell them if they're going to a changeable copy, if we get a complaint, they'll probably be asked to either dim it and or shut it off during their time hours. Especially if they're adjacent to a residential district. On page 34 or 46 of the packet, underneath number three, fences, rocks, and other structures, he asked why not? Why not use fences, rocks, and other structure features for signage? And I didn't have an answer, so I guess it's up for discussion if we want to allow signage on rocks, um, typically, or specifically rocks, he mentioned, um, or let the ordinance stand as is. I know in residential developments like in St. Cloud, Lake Park, Dominic Cities, it'll say like Dover Heights and it's been engraved into a big stone type structure at the beginning of their development. It works. Um, is that something we want to be able to do here? Well, the golf course does. They have it on rocks. Mm -hmm. Maybe that would be our future paint level in the Painsville sign. Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't see any sense why we do have it. We have a huge rock at this part. We do. So I mean, it's not a plaque on it. But we don't have some rocks. <clears throat> so maybe we want to just um, take out the word rock and it would allow rocks for now. Maybe that's a compromise. I'm fine with that. Take out the word rock. Okay. Is there a reason why? We're keeping in not attached to a building by adhesive. I was just thinking of that myself. As I mean, if the owner doesn't care, or if the owners, you know, put it on there. Yeah. I was, by adhesive. That's what it says. I don't know. With adhesive or by other similar means. But they never use it easily. Usually it's just stable. I guess, I guess, you know, I mean, I'd just be worried about safety. Just randomly gluing stuff to buildings. But, but maybe maybe it's fine, I, I guess, if you use a good enough adhesive. But The adhesive will break down over time. Therefore, it's going to lose its Sticky. purpose of sticking paper to the building or whatever. And then it becomes an issue of, Who's going to clean it up? Is it going to be, you know, well, if it was, it was just paper, I'm not worried about safety, but I mean, people can use adhesive to yeah, right. glue wood with, with paper on it. I mean, uh, oh, yeah, right. Wouldn't that, maybe the building code doesn't cover it, but I'm thinking I mean, all of the brick facades in town are held on by an adhesive. Is, no. is that problematic? Order. Order is an adhesive. How is the marquee held on at the... Well, I think it's a combination of adhesive and some sort of metal fastener. There's, yeah, but the, the old ones probably aren't. But they're not signs. That's just the building. Right. But if it's a safety concern, no. it is an adhesive. Is there a way to put it into building code? Is that something that's probably not, huh? So what if you put a put a like a sticker on your window to prevent like the sun coming in, like the because that would be an adhesive as well. I don't think that'd be fine. Yeah, that's not it. Because I was thinking that that's not a sign. 
Uh, well, if you have a Pokemon symbol on it or something. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, it's still not going to... It's still it's out of this window, perfect. it's not on the building. Oh. But the windows is part of it. Yeah. No. I don't know. It just seems kind of restrictive to me, especially if people want to put something on their building. <laughs> Most of the time, oh. they, they attach them to screws. <coughs> Doesn't matter to me if you're good with adhesive. I'm fine with it. I, I just, it, I, it, you know, I just, I don't, I don't know about the effectiveness of that as a method of attachment, but. In the definition for sign, it talks about the nature of being, you know, advertising and advertising. So, it won't stick in the way. Right. On the brick buildings. That's why they're screwed in. I would just take the whole thing out, number three. Okay, delete number three. Yeah, it's, it's, delete number it's three. too confusing. Okay. Let's just take it out. So that was on page um, 34. Uh, 35, um, Pat has suggested, suggested maybe deleting the egg district because we don't really have any egg properties, but we actually do. Uh, we have quite a bit of eggs, so we're going to leave in the egg district if you don't mind. So we don't have any. Um, then we're going to go to page 40 or 52 of the packet. That was just a typo um, under I or 2-1. Two, two um, the footage has been increased. That was like a note that we had in there. So we caught that as a typo. Um, then we're going to go over to page 49. Um, C2 which is very similar to the question you had on pupils. Um, boarding or renting of rooms of not one or two persons. This is a number. It's a number that we've had. Like I said, it can be changed to any, any number. If somebody has a better suggestion, we can certainly change. If you had a dairy farm in an ag district, they'd have more workers than that that they'd have to rent rooms to. But we don't have, and I don't anticipate that we're ever going to have ag property in the city limits that has a working farm. Um, I guess it's possible, but I, I can't imagine where we would take in a, a, an operating farm situation into the city limits. I mean. Right now, the land that we have in the city limits that's ag, the only reason it's ag is because our ordinance says if land is annexed to the city, it comes in as ag until the owner asks us to rezone it. And so the Furchie property is zoned to ag. Other than that, there might be a couple other small pieces, but it's There's not a section up by um, Park Lumber, and there's also um, the all lot of Heatherwood is also ag. Until they're developed. Yes. Like that. And like, um, you know, Mr. Dabrowski has it in CRP right now. And for cheese, land I believe just like mowed for grass, like for hay. It's not big enough for a dairy farm or something like that. <laughs> no, no, no. So if you're good with two, we can leave it as two for an hour. We can change it to four. We can leave it at two. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's okay. fine. All right. Um, the next. One is on page um, 52. Um, this is where the conversation started, um, and it's not noted anywhere in your piece of paper, but this is where we started the conversation on granny homes and tiny homes. So I just thought I would bring that back up. Um, the council has, or did vote against the granny homes some time ago. Um, tiny homes, we talked about it both in planning and in council, that, you know, typically those would be addressed in a development all by themselves. PUD. Uh, like a PUD. The lots would probably be smaller because the homes are smaller. Um, you know, typically we would not do a development where we had 
maybe you know 100 by 75 foot lots or 150 by 75 foot lots and have a $320,000 home on one lot and a tiny home on the next lot. Um, I think the tiny homes would be their own development. Well, you know, it could be there's a time coming where you could use a granny home, but I think what we could say is it has to have a certain lot size. You don't want one on just a little 50 by 75 lot or something. Yeah, you're never you're never going to fit it in a lot. Of, the old lots in town, you, they you, wouldn't you, fit. You, you're going to exceed the lot coverage right. to attract a town. It's not going to work. So I think we should allow them if their property is big enough. So right now, unless you combine a couple lots out of logo and maybe maybe Heatherwood, that would be the only place that they would fit. Yeah, they won't. But Heatherwood won't allow it because it's got covenants and neither will logo. We almost have an acre. Sure. Smack dab in the middle of town. Yeah. The only thing the only thing different about yours is that yours doesn't have any it just has the front access. You know, for that second home, the access to that might be a little more difficult. But But it could work. It could work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If the lot size is big enough, I think we should allow it. <laughs> so what would you think would be a lot size that would make sense. I mean, I guess we could do some calculations. We, yeah, we do a percentage right now of lot coverage, don't we? Like, well, currently in the, in the R, in the residential district, you can't exceed 40% of your lot coverage. So I guess you would allow a grand home <coughs> if they would not exceed 40% of the lot coverage. Exactly. Exactly. No, that's all true. And what are we, because I know some people who have like guest areas <coughs> in, you know, a garage or a, you know, what, what's stopping that from being different? Well, typically, if you're going to do it in a garage, it's going to be upstairs, and Granny's not going to like the stairs. Right. Uh, that's I, I'm just saying that if, if it was, or, you know, if you did, I don't know. Well, yeah. Is there anything that is going to, would we say that this isn't allowed, is there anything that's going to disallow that? I wouldn't think so, because if you want to convert your garage into a living space, as long as it's still part of your 40% lot. It also has to meet the height restrictions. Yeah. I mean, this has been done in the past. Where they have a garage. They have a garage, and the garage is now a second. Living There's home people right in here. town that live Labor. in their garages. Yeah, yeah. As long as the lots coverage is covered, they have converted their their garage into an additional living space. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that should be still. Okay. That's what you desire, I guess. That's yeah. Jen, did I send you? all of the slides that I got on Granny Homes from, I think, the league? You did. Okay. Does the league call them Granny Homes? No. No, there was a politically correct one that's failing me at the moment. I can't remember if I know Pat, you know, distinctly called them a quote unquote Granny Home. Right. Something dwelling. Unit. Yeah. So for now, um, we can add it in as a permitted use. We'll we'll get the correct term for it, and we'll allow it if it does not exceed the lot coverage for that district. Okay. okay. Perfect. Tiny homes we'll leave out for now unless we get a development that is like them. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, if they buy some property someplace where there's room to put half a dozen. So what would be the definition then of the least amount of square feet that you could build? 800, 800 square feet is the minimum residential size. Is there a reason why we can't lower that to 800 or 500 to keep housing affordable? Um, so right now the 800 square feet, and it has been in the ordinance forever, um, is typically um, your single wide trader home, which is something is usually 12 by 60, which is 720 square feet. So that's why the minimum is 800. And I think, I think Brad has told us that that's in the building code, in, in the uh, in the building code that the 800 square feet is minimum um, for a residence. I'm pretty sure that Brad has told us that, but. That would absolutely be a Brad question. I'm not sure about that. Yeah. We could double check, but I think he's told us that. Accessory dwelling unit. 
That's it. That was close. That's it. <coughs> so granny is an accessory. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the correct term. Do they have anything about minimum square feet for those? I'm trying to pull uh, So, well, no. But I was taking a look. I don't know that I sent you the full presentation. I just sent you the flyer. Okay. I think it's worthwhile for, oh no, you were copied on her response, so you got it. So the example they used was the city of Northfield, one ADU per lot. Can be located as part of a detached garage or its own separate structure. Must have kitchen, bathroom, sanitary, and water services. Cannot exceed 50% of the gross floor area of the main home or 1,000 square feet, whichever is less. Must be at least 10 feet away. Do not count towards the allowed amount of lot coverage. They don't. They do not. And they are not subject to the 20% rental density restriction. <coughs> It's nice if they specify one. One per one lot. Visit, yeah. yeah that's. I think it might make sense um, <coughs> for planning to take it closer. But for safety this. purposes, it's good to specify that it has, you know, toiletry areas. Yeah. And that it's 10 feet away. <laughs> mm -hmm. I bet that's fire. I bet that's fire code. Yes. Yeah. 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 I like my girl on my dad. <coughs> I guess what would make sense to me is if the council indicates that we're willing to amend the ordinance to include these, to have planning take a deep dive into how exactly they would look. then that would delay doing this zoning. No, I think we can move forward with everything else as is. This can come back as an amendment. I have a question on tiny homes. Are those the type that are on wheels and movable, almost like a fancy fish homes, or are they? Well, that's uh, certainly, I mean, that, that, that's a question. I mean, if you permit them, do you permit them? On wheels, or or do you require that they be on a foundation? I mean, you know, that's, that's two different things. But certainly, some tiny homes. I know there's uh, some uh, church organizations in Minnesota that are producing tiny homes, and they're on wheels. I mean, they're basically a camp. Right. You know, um, and, and and the problem being is our winters with uh, water and sewer, trying to keep that going. Well, when we move forward, we can specify that it has to have a foundation if that's something that the we could that we choose to do so. And that would be, you know, if, if somebody was doing it through a planned unit development, all of that would have to be specified. I mean, that would all be part of the deal. You'd you'd lay out the lots, you'd lay out the, all the details that would be part of putting together your planned unit development. Would be all the details of that. So that's, but I mean, you know, we could get a request to allow. Some that are mobile, and we'd have to deal with it. I mean, you know, that would, that would, but that would be a request like any other addition or amendment to zoning that would would be brought forward. If a developer wanted to do that, and the city wanted to consider that as a low cost housing option, we'd have to look at it and talk about it. But right now, you could you couldn't do it except through a PUD, and then the PUD would have to be approved with that as part of it. Yeah, my, my concern is water and sewer in the winter. Be. Yep. Not as easy as in California or Arizona. All right, so we're going to leave tiny homes just out for now. And if we get a um, that wants to do it, a development, we can act on it. 
I mean, I, I can get the Northfield ordinance on. I mean, maybe you've got maybe you've got the whole thing already, Sean. But I, I can get that easily enough and share that for planning, so they could look at it as a starting point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would like that. Yep, that's a good idea. Okay. Um, page 56 of the ordinance, or 68 of the packet. In the box, um, there was a typo. Oh, okay. Um, so that has been fixed. And then um, from here on out in the districts, um, Pat questioned building height. If there was a need to address building height, um, and I guess I will leave that up to you guys' discussion. Which page is that? It's um, 56. 56 of the ordinance or 68 of the agenda. And it's number three. And each district has a height requirement as well as accessory structures. So we have increased the height for silos already. And I think his, his main point was in, in the commercial districts, why, why don't we want to encourage people to build higher? Well, we haven't really had anybody asking to build higher, except, I guess, we had the four-story um, R2. Yeah, so the apartment building, of course, they, and the, um, I believe the apartments got, you know, both various for height, and then, of course, AMPI for their silos, and then the other one was, um, I believe, Senex for the legs of the fertilizer plant. So, there is a tower of an industrial park that got, it was a cellular tower that got a variance, but otherwise everybody has been able to meet the height restrictions. And we tried to change the stuff for the silos and towers so we didn't have to deal with that over and over again. But but if you think we should go higher on, you know, on general structures in some of the zones. I always thought I was concerned about fire, but apparently that's not really a big deal to the fire department. They, I, they don't seem super concerned about it. I think it would be a concern in the downtown district where the buildings are basically connected to each other, but I guess in other areas, maybe it's not as big of a concern. If people want to build higher, I, maybe we shouldn't be overly concerned about it. Maybe maybe we should be less restrictive on height. I, you know, like I said, it's not a it's not a common request to go higher, but maybe maybe we um, could go higher in some of the districts and not not hurt ourselves. There is something in city planning and community planning where they're not supposed to be above a certain height, but I don't know what height that is. And it's for overall friendliness of when you're walking down the street. You know, there is a concern, you know, especially in the residential districts, if you don't have a height restriction and you're on a smaller lot, people will tend to build upwards. It's also cheaper to go up than it is out. So potentially, you are screening your neighbor from that openness, that sunlight. Um, so you know that's you know probably why we have you know accessory buildings are only 16 feet to the to the peak, um, so that we don't have all these large accessory buildings with a loft or two um, on them, so that your neighbor can actually see out of their lot. Because we have a fair amount of 50 foot lots. I think, I think we're pretty normal on heights in our residential districts. I think we might be a little restrictive in um, the R2 and. Um, That's what I was thinking. If we end up with another apartment building or something that wants to be tall yeah. to keep getting variances or can, you know. And it's not so bad to get a variance. At least everybody's aware of what they're going to build. Um, the, you know, the fire department gets a little. Um, they get notice of what's coming. We can plan for equipment for such type of structures. So it's not it's not that, that it's a negative. It's, it gives you public awareness also. You know, we, we tend to think of you know, conditional uses and variances and all of those as a negative, but sometimes it's a positive um, because of just the public awareness of it. So, but would it make sense if we're going to say, look, this is our zoning ordinance that we've been really lenient with in the past, and now, since we're bringing it up to date, we're going to be a little bit firmer with it. To say for R2, you know, you can go up to 45 feet or whatever, but you have to have a conditional use permit to go that high. So that way we are addressing things and making sure that 
water pressure is there for fire suppression. Well, the only thing is it would be a variance rather than a conditional use, but we, I mean, we could do either way. It's, it's the same, basically the same process and the same cost to the landowner. I don't know that it matters whether you call it a conditional use or a variance, but we could. I mean, we could say it's a conditional use, but it doesn't save them any money to call it one rather than the other. It doesn't save them money, but it lets them know that there's a willingness for it to happen rather than them saying, well, you know, I don't know if I should even ask because they're going to say no. Yeah. Well, that's true. well and the, the whole pressure thing and uh, fire suppression in the water, that's all um, addressed in the civil plan review. Um, so that doesn't typically come to planning. That's usually done, um, <coughs> which we have enough to do it done by the building department and our engineer. So I don't know, maybe we want to add 10 feet to, you know, our dwellings and our industrial, maybe even our commercial, maybe 10 feet is enough. Then rather putting them into a conditional use. Yeah, then they constantly be doing variances or conditional uses. Because yeah, a lot of that will show up in the permit. When they do the building permit, the fire department will look at, you know. Uh, well, they don't look at the building permits. The fire department does not look at that. But we do <coughs> have to make sure that there's enough the water coming in. They have to, they have to be able to pass the, the water pressure test. I would like to see for like large residential like apartment buildings a process where it's known that we're open to considering it, but I'm hesitant to just make it official until we can afford to get a ladder truck in the city. Because if we get too many buildings in, we're going to start earning our ISO rating and we're going to start seeing homeowners insurance rates going up. That's a good point. Um, and we're not there yet, and I think we probably have a ways to go. Um, but that's why I think it would be helpful to just be able to keep an eye on it. And then when the day comes where we're fortunate enough to get ourselves a ladder truck or something that can offset the ding to our ISO rating, then we increase the flat amount. Okay, so we'll leave the heights as is. That's my thought for right now. I, I, I think I think that makes sense. It's worked in the past with the two or three high rise things that may come in the next ten years, I think we can handle. Yeah. But I would like to I think it should be clear that we're open to considering them somehow. And I don't know if that's done best through listing it as a conditional use permit or listing it as a potential variance option. Uh, because somebody coming in to build a building isn't going to, well, they probably would care about a $400 filing fee, but they shouldn't. I would think if we were to raise the limit, it would be one less headache that a developer would have. Instead of having to come to the city hall, ask for a variance or whatever they need to uh, proceed. But if it's already in place, that's one less thing for them to worry about, which would make it more appealing to, um, direct a structure here instead of going to the next town over and having to worry about dealing with city council and whatever it will take along the way. And the time involved in it. I kind of agree with Paul. I think if we raised it 10 feet, it wouldn't. That gives them the answer. In R2? In R2 only, yeah. What about downtown? No. Because I think if we're going to do R2, we should do downtown as well. That's going to bring in more residential downtown. Huh? Yeah, we could do 10 feet down the commercial. Then you're up to 45. Yeah. Hey, Josh, can I ask you a construction type question? Sure. If you were going to add another story, another level of apartments, is 10 feet enough? Yeah, it should be. Hmm? My thing is what Paul was saying about the, you know, developers not wanting to come at the deal, it's going to be too much of a headache. Is the Question that Pat had um, on page two, where it says, except in the most unusual of circumstances, the variance of the ordinance will be denied. Um, and I don't know if maybe there's another way that we should word that, or. Well, we, that's where we were going to put a reference to the okay. variance section. Yeah, because on because then on page fourteen it says something about um, to be granted only when it's demonstrated that the waiving of the provision will be in harmony with the general purpose and intent. Yeah. Chapter, which I think is. Yeah, yeah. that's what Jennifer so raised, right? So we're going to say, yeah, it just seems, I mean, even with the, um, you know, like the foot 
note or whatever to check that one. It just seems like that's kind you're of. Just, you're just going to refer them to uh, the, the whole variance um, section. So by rights, if we're so, they, so the standard is recited exactly what it is at the law. So if we're, if we're issuing a lot of variances, whatever the matter may be, that is a, that's a red flag for us to amend that section. To fix it. Yeah. So if we're only issuing variances for special circumstances like the apartments, is that enough to warrant a change in the ordinance or not? <coughs> What I think what Sean was alluding to is once this ordinance is amended and up updated, we would hope that the Planning Commission and Council would hold true to the definition of variance. Mm -hmm. And unless there is severe circumstances, they should be denied. Okay. On, on those height things, would, would we be doing R2, C1, C2, I1, and I2, or not all of those, or what's the thinking? I think those are the ones that I could see we could increase by. And maybe leave the R. Um, the R1 should stay what it is. And then the R, um, RM and the R1A, I think those could stay yep. as they are. Because the I1 and the I2, that. Those are 45 feet right now. Yeah. And we've already addressed the silos. So we really don't need to change those at this time. Well, maybe not. I don't know. I mean, you know, if somebody, but if we thought we were going to have an industry that needed a six story building, but the industries we have, by and large, are one or two stories. I mean, we don't, we don't have a lot of really big industrial buildings right now. I mean, you know, we, we, we can hope that we're going to get one, but I don't, somehow I don't think we're going to jump from a two story industrial building to a six story industrial no, I building. Know. I feel like 45 feet, that's probably a, a strong four story building. I think the I-1 and I-2 is fine the way it is. Yeah. It's just the R-2 and the C-1 C2. and C-2. So if we look on page 56 of the ordinance, that is our R-2. That currently is at one and a half stories or 35 feet in height. To the highest point of the roof structure or the roof surface. Well, a two-story building is still 35 feet. I don't know, we got them all over town, so. Yeah. I think, I don't know. I'm assuming I mean, they must be. I would say it's, it's probably close to the peak of the roof, but yeah. That's, that's probably, it's probably fairly tight. Are we going to run into airport issues? We shouldn't run into airport issues, should we? No, I, that was one thing I was going to say. <coughs> we could give them a number. And if Ron deems that the FAA zoning for that would be um, a hindrance, then we would just go back to the regular. But if you give me numbers, we'll, we'll forward the ordinance with those new numbers unless Ron says otherwise. So what? I like 45 or 50 in R2. Because that gets us to three and a half, or I don't know if we get to four, um, and then in C one and C two, because I think we should open up more housing in our C one and C two areas as well. Okay, we'll just make a fifty feet across the board. Any opposition to that? I think that's going to open new opportunities. Yep. Oh, yep. If there is. Um, uh, an outside concern that we'd like to construct in town um, that will make it easier for a ladder truck forward thinking. Now, I'm not thinking anytime soon, but if the town's going to be able to grow, you know, at a measured pace um, and increase the tax base, I think we're kind of headed in the right direction with this one. Yeah. Yep, yeah, I think so. Okay, so we will change um, the height of the buildings in R2 to 50, C1, C2 to 50 feet. Yep. yep. Sounds good. So page 57 or 69 of the packet, a letter back there was a typo. Um, and then it was asked under Manufacturing Home District um, B2, why it needed a conditional use. And we'd like to keep it as a conditional use so that when somebody builds a brand new mobile home park, we can address um, street sizes, we can address lot sizes, you know, can address that there's a shelter 
there's enough green space, there's plays <coughs> for, for children that might be um, living there. There's just so many things that we want to address so that we don't end up with a park that's unusable. Yep, yep. that leaves it in our hands. Um, he asked what R1A was on page 59 of the ordinance or 71 of the packet. R1A is all in park. So we'd like to keep that district. I think you told him that that night. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, page 61 of the ordinance or 73 of the packet. Um, he questioned 800 square feet. Um, and I did visit with Brad about this a little bit and it is to, to address it. Are we, are we wanting the single wide trade homes? The wide is a seven, 720 square feet. So our minimum square footage is 800. No, keep it as well. Yeah, I think that's. Um, on the bottom of that same page. But that means that we're not allowing a single wide in a new development. That's right. Unless it's different. Unless it's in a whole part of the whole part. Yeah. What about a triple wide? Yeah. Well, it's on a lot. If it fits on a lot, as long as it's over 800 square feet. Okay. Because there's a lot of double wides. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we have a lot of double wide residents. Mm -hmm. yes. oh. Most of the little globe is a double wide. Yep. And I, that was a mistake on my part. I was confused in what section we were in. Okay. okay. I'm on the very bottom of that, too, under the central downtown district, um, page 61 or 73 of the packet, um, under B, the very last sentence um, that says completely enclosed structure. Um, he asked if we could maybe change that to so that we would allow the patios like for Queen Bees and the patios for Firehose, outdoor storage maybe for PJs. So I think there's some fidelity there. I think we need to maybe um, maybe rework that a little bit. We're leaving it up to you to yay or nay that if we want to um, because we already have it. Okay. Yeah, we should. So what about as a permitted accessory use is the uh, the service of food and drink in an outdoor patio type environment in conformity with the main operation of the business. So actually, um, you read my mind. Um, so we added under page 64 of the ordinance or 76 of the packet under permitted accessory use, we added number four. Well, we'd like to add number four, excuse me, patios, exterior seating for dining and service. Yeah. Yeah, that will work. However, it does not address like the outdoor usage of storage for like PJs um, with the appliances that are like maybe no longer working. So that would seem like it would go back to the whole salvager, you know. Well, you said, yeah, I was going to say he hauls them out all the time. It's yeah, but they're, they may sit there and they could be there for a couple weeks. Yeah. Do we care? Or, and maybe they, he just, he just takes them away as necessary. I haven't really looked. I assume he takes the doors off and then does everything that he needs to to be safe. I don't know. We, we haven't had any, you know, complaints. He hasn't come in, so maybe we just leave it. Yeah, let's leave it. For him. Okay. Well, probably does have a point on if a kid ever went in there, it would be a tragedy. But I mean, if it 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 legally, he does take that stuff off the doors. The legally, he's got to take the doors off. He's supposed to legally, yeah. I don't think they are. I, no. Yeah, most doors these days are just made, made, magnet. It's a latch. So, but it'd be still a good idea. I mean, it goes back to what do we want our town, downtown to look like? What kind of people do we want to attract to our community? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. It's not pretty, but, you know, it depends. I guess if your emphasis is on encouraging business, you know, I get it. But at the same time, it's, it's, not, it's not a beautiful thing. And do we want to start? And if you're, if you're, promoting, if you're promoting housing downtown, <laughs> it starts to be, you know, how does that look? Because there's housing right across the street. Well, and that was my other thing is, are we going to get a complaint from that future housing that's there? Even just other businesses being adjacent to it. And does it fall under really zoning or does it fall under nuisance? I'm inclined to think it probably falls more under nuisance 
because it also has an environmental component to it, where if we have refrigerators out there, are they leaking coolant into the ground? That's the issue that kind of bothers me if the boards are wrong. Some kid gets in there and falls over and they're not going to lift the door up. He does have space where he lives to all these and store them at his relative, his lamb, but then by doing that, uh, you have to say that it's not a law, but well, then. Well, it's hard to do something now when he's been doing it for right. 25 years or so. Too. So the only other thing we could uh, enforce taking off doors or putting a fence around. And one we don't want to force them out of town either. One of the two, I think, could be in order. But at that point, you might say, well, I'll just haul it over the car. Not storefront. Not storefront. No. And we've pretty much always done that. But we need to 
Solution. Clarify. So, yeah, yes. I, I just think it needs to be put out there so it's easy for people that are coming to yeah. town buying a downtown commercial building. <laughs> they know right off the bat what they can do with that building. Well, I could have a business in there. I could rent out an apartment or two or three. Um, I need a building permit and it has to be safe. What if somebody tore down an existing business and built a new structure for it? As housing from the 100%. That would be an allowed to that. Or, well, that would be an allowed use because we're going to say multifamily dwellings, apartments, more than one unit <coughs> is allowed. <coughs> because we already have that with the plaza. So if right. somebody were to tear down, let's just say, um, I don't know, one of the buildings and they wanted to put up another plaza, we would, if you make the amendment, we would allow it. So the, the restrictions on the storefront would be in an existing commercial business, you can have, you can use the rear top or basement, but not the storefront. Correct. Now, if you tear down that existing structure and you want to build a housing structure just for housing, like the plaza, I think then we will then we put out. Or if you want to build a new structure. With housing and commercial. commercial. Like Pat had, had come a couple years ago with you know housing on the top and small commercial businesses on the bottom, kind of like a little strip mall. Yep. Uh, yeah, I mean we're open to any and all ideas. Covering our bases, yeah. I think that's a good idea. We've been talking about it for years. We have been I was you know, I thought about this a lot and I think housing always parking right now. Mm -hmm. And I've been a stickler about the parking because we've had so many people come. Jean can attest to this, but I think housing outweighs the parking. We just have to vacate that little half street between my and Kay's building, and we'll have a parking lot. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's what we're going to have. A parking lot. So, um, Bill and I will get some language to make sure that we're good with that, but we're going to allow it as an allowable use if you guys agree yep. to that. Yep. Yep. We do. Okay. 110%. Yep. Um, okay, so on that same page, um, 65 of the um, ordinance and 77 of the agenda, he questioned the intent for highway commercial. So he just questioned it. I don't know, do we want to change it? Do we want to leave it? This is new language. It's not, and this was amended. So if we like the new language, we can keep it as is, and if not, we can change it. I think it's fine. Okay. All right, um, then switching over to page 67 of the ordinance, 79 of the packet, you'll see um, quite a few lines there. He um, questioned the light manufacturing, um, what was allowed and what was not allowed, and we had a very small uh, list, and we have expanded that list to encompass a few more things, plus encompass the, the, the items that we have in our existing city. So um, look through that and see if you mind or don't mind the added language. Well, the more clear we can make it, the better. Built on that language from another city, I believe. Okay. Okay, so 78 on the very next page. Um, he questioned the footage again, but we've already uh, tackled that, so we're gonna skip right over that. Um, page 70 or 82 of the packet, under Shoreland. He questioned if our Shoreland Overlay District could be enforced um, by Stearns County, and I will defer that to them. No. <laughs> oh, well, that's that. They don't want it. They don't want it nothing to do with it. Okay. And I will remind you that our Shoreland Overlay District was not changed. If we change it, our shoreline overlay district will be 100 pages, and it will have all the restrictions that DNR has imposed, which are much greater than what we have. Okay. So that includes even changing the sewage system setback. Yes. Yep. Um, on page 79 of the ordinance and 91 of the packet, he made a note that the planned unit development just took up too much time, involves too much money, and. We have a few planned unit developments, and I, I don't see that as a big hindrance. I actually see that as a, a positive thing for a developer if they want to do smaller lots, um, do a, you know, do a twin home 
um, type um, development like we have up at Meadowview Court, that's a planned unit development. Our for sale garages that Mike Hench just did up in Industrial Park, that is a PUD, as well as Alden Park is a PUD. So I think we, I don't think that that is a hindrance. Um, very next page, 80 of the ordinance or 92 of the packet. We just cleared up some language on number six. Um, we took out amongst other things. Oh yeah. Just seemed a little bit clumsy there. Wordy. Can we back up just a second? Yeah. Would there be a way to, in the, <laughs> I don't want to talk about intents anymore, but um, include language that plan unit development could be explicitly for developing like a tiny home yes. development unit? Or Just add a sentence at the very end of it maybe? Something like that. That or refers to tiny home developments so that we've addressed it as a cost uh, with, with a foundation. Well, it well, would be a planned unit, so it would have to come to us anyway. We could clear, yeah, that's true. specify that. Yep. Is it easier to just specify it right off the bat? Mm -hmm. um, I would also agree with Katie that we would want it on a um, permanent foundation as well as we do have it on our double bikes right now. Mm -hmm. All over the globe, they are in an enclosed um, solid perimeter foundation. There's actually an ordinance that states that. Okay. So um, you want on solid perimeter foundation. Okay. Okay. And we could just say something like they're intended to address unique developments which could include many things such as tiny homes on solid perimeter foundation. Right. Yes. Yeah. That perfect. Yeah. Do you need to specify a winterize? I don't think you need to specify I, I think they all would be pretty much. I mean, we would, we, it would be ridiculous for us to approve a development that didn't have, you know, homes with proper insulation, heating, you know, whatever. I mean, it's, it, it's in Minnesota. They have to. I mean, it's, it would be, they it's still have to be able to cool. Yes. Yeah, 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 they, they have to be able to cool for Minnesota. Yeah. Yeah. Now, okay, a question for Brad is how do they apply code to tiny homes? But I, I assume that they have to meet code. So I have a handout if anybody's interested, and maybe I'll include it in your next packet. But it's tiny houses and the 2020 Minnesota Residential Code for such. So um, they have addressed them. I did ask Brad if tiny homes are prevalent in Minnesota. They are in Duluth, I guess, as a development. Um, but he's gone through quite a few trainings and conferences, and there's just not a lot of out-state Minnesota. There just isn't a lot of them. So maybe some. They will be with the economy the way it is. Maybe it's the way to go. But. I know. Okay. I think they're a fad. So just a couple of things left, and then I will be done talking. Um, page 93 or 105 of the agenda um, regarding section 36-128, um, <coughs> wind energy. Um, Pat wanted to see wind energy allowed on residential structures. Um, and I, I talked to Brad about this, and I think we don't want to just, just allow them. I think if they're going to do something, um, we would want them to get conditional use because just the height and where they are located in the city, if they would be, like if we were to develop a stone burner property that's in a fly zone, how high are these structures going to be? How are they going to be attached? How are they going to meet um, Minnesota wind drift and snow load? Those types of things. And I think wind, just like the solar, was really prevalent, and now it's not so prevalent again. So I, I would just say no right now. Just leave it as it is. They do make a humming noise that could be quite annoying. Yeah, they also do. They also have the light flicker, and they also, you know, could kill birds because the big windmills. Do all of that. So, I mean, so does climate change kill birds. But um, I think there are systems being developed in Europe now where you have cylindrical towers um, that are probably 10 feet tall that just sit on the ground and they, they spin to generate the electricity. Um, but I don't know that they've made their way over here yet, and I don't know that they're 
I think they're probably still a little cost prohibitive. So I'm okay with keeping it for now, knowing that as the <coughs> develops, we can always revisit in the future. This could change in five to 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, and, you know, it wasn't just too long ago that we actually um, made the wind and solar energy um, ordinances because they didn't pertain to us for the longest time. And now, you know, we have the ordinances that pertain to us. And those who want them, it's not hard to come and get a conditional use permit, correct? It is not. No, it's less than 60 days, it's $500, and they get to greet you and the council. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Um, okay, any other provisions of the zoning ordinance that anyone wants to chat about? Okay, coming back, do we need to have another public hearing? I suppose we do, we're making more changes. Yep. Exactly. Consider changes. Um, anyone from planning feel like we should have a joint planning and city council public hearing? Otherwise, I was thinking the council will just take it up. Yeah, yeah. Straight up. Okay. I just have one thing to mention. What are the odds? Um, I would like to see more protection in this for uh, single family homes that are within the range of first time home buyers to be. Uh, safeguarded or preserved for first-time home buyers and not chopped up into rentals. I don't disagree. Do you have proposed revisions that would do that? I do not, but I'm okay. sure there's somebody here smarter than I am that could figure it out. Legally, can you... Well, I mean, we had, we had, at one point we visited this issue of, uh, you know, restricting uh, rental units within a block uh, to a percentage and I think the council and planning both decided it was a ridiculous idea. I mean that's the only thing that I can think of off the top of my head that would try to preserve mm -hmm. uh, housing for ownership rather than rental is to restrict the amount of houses that could be used for rental. Um, and you know, we had a lot of uh, people that felt strongly that if you wanted to rent your house, you ought to be able to rent your house. And why should you be restricted? Because you happen to be unlucky enough to live on a block where two people already do it, and you, you're going to become the one that puts it over the 20% limit or whatever it is, you know. And so we got a lot of pushback on the whole concept. Um, and and it's not it's not a, a kind of a restriction that's common in Minnesota. It exists. I mean, I think. It's college towns like Northfield and Winona and, and towns like that that have done it because there's pressure in those towns. I mean, wow, well, because the houses are easy to rent and you can make pretty good money at it. Um, but I, it, it's not it's not everywhere. You don't see them all over the place. So, but that I, I mean, I guess a person could think more about it. But that's the thing that comes to my mind, Katie, when I you know when I think about how would you try to. Um, Preserve more homes for I ownership. think that's infringing on rights and that it's too much government control. And, and how are you going to enforce? And how do you enforce? I mean, kind of a can of worms. Yeah. We don't have. It's, it's local control. In you know, the last yeah, year. I don't want to tell somebody that owns a house and they're moving away and so they need to rent their house because we're going to be gone for a year that they and can't have this. And the entire neighborhood turns to rental. Yeah, but well, your your economy will get. Here's how I see it. So a lot of homes that were rentals have been sold because of the extreme sure. high house pricing, yeah. and as that drops again, it can go the other way. But the economy dictates the number of rentals. Uh, I look at it this way. I think we have a zoning ordinance right now uh, that we have spent. Mom. Jennifer got here 21 years ago, and we've been working on updating it ever since. Is that about right? 16 for sure. 16 for sure. Um, I have promised Jennifer a new binder, and um, I'm told she's not going to order one until the ordinance is approved. I agree, Katie. I think we need to talk about what we can do to protect those things. I don't know the solution. Um, but I don't want to hold up this zoning ordinance that I think makes some really good changes, knowing that we can always, we can continue to evaluate those things going forward. Um, Have we seen that be an issue in towns that were not college towns or? 
So I don't know. Um, I just can't see it being a financially viable option for an out-of-state investor to want to do. I think in bigger cities you saw it more. I, I don't know that you had a lot of out-of-state investors come into small towns, but I'd say in the metro area you had a lot of investors, I think, right. come in and buy up properties. Yeah, so um, maybe it's just something you should keep an eye out for and not worry about it. Well, what I'm trying to say here is let's move forward with today. So the question is, do we need to have a joint planning meeting? I hear from Josh, he doesn't think so. No, I, don't. I think it's probably fine. The council can hold a public hearing on this. Uh, but if planning wants to be there, you all are welcome. Uh, so I think we'll bring this back to the city council. We'll do a public hearing on it and we'll pass it, um, hopefully sooner rather than later. And then we can keep talking about the need for rental density and how boomers like Gene are driving up single right now. <laughs> well, on this rental deal, don't you kind of open up the city for lawsuits because you're going to tell me what to do with my home? We already do. Yeah, I mean, you know, Neil, that's well, that, that's that, that old saw doesn't really care water for me. I mean, every regulation you pass is a possibility of a lawsuit. You know, I mean, it, it's it, it. I mean, and the, this fight has been fought in some of these college towns, and it's been upheld. I, I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't like the idea of being threatened with litigation, but I, I think as a, you know, as a matter of fact, it, it's it's enforceable. You know, it it, it it's just. It's a administrative headache to keep track of this stuff, and you know, and, and we don't have a huge staff. I, I, I'm more worried about the burden we put on staff mm -hmm. and the ability to track some of these things than I am about some right. landowners right. suing us. But, but yeah, but I know I, I understand. I mean, you don't you don't want to make people mad, and sometimes the more regulation you do, the more you irritate people, and that and it's true. But I but I think it's a it's a, method, it's, it's a method that's allowed. It's hard to balance. Yeah. yeah there are a lot of people right now that are looking for rentals or a first time home reasonably priced. And neither one is just an overabundance. Not just a sign of the times. And it doesn't stop at the local level either. It's, you know, with the state, you know, uh, if you start renting your property out, then you have to um, reclassify it as non homestead. And then wait for your property tax statement the year after that. See how, if it doubles or triples, something like that. All right. Let's, uh, if there's no further changes tonight, we'll move forward with the, or the changes that we've discussed. And that will come to council when it's ready next week. No, we have to have the hearing posted. I know. So it'll either be the last meeting in August or the first meeting in September. For the public hearing, yeah. But Good. it will come to council to set the public to hearing. To set it based on when we can get all the changes made, because I would not want to try to set up all those changes made. Fair enough. Um, all right. So just quickly, um, if you want to go to the building inspector report, by the yeah. planning commission yeah. is still That's here. Yep. What I was thinking. Um, I, pr I printed actually two reports for you this time, and because Tarek had brought up a really good point, and we had this at our staff meeting, but I printed you the permits that have been issued since January 1 through um, half of the year, which is June 30th, and then I also gave you your traditional report of the open inspections. But if you take a look at the first report, um, it gives you how many permits we've issued through half of the year, um, what the total fees that have come in, and the value of those permits. Um, I also printed um, for the, our staff meeting was what we did last year during this time frame. And this year we only have done 46 permits. Last year was 63. We are down a little. Um, last year's valuations were way up because we had some really big construction projects, if you recall. Mm -hmm. um, the difference, the biggest difference is last year we had COVID money. Last year we had a beautiful spring. This year we have no COVID money and we had a horrible spring. Last year, materials were you know, nowhere to be seen. This year, we have some materials, or they're out six, eight, 12 weeks. Um, but we still have that inflation on cost of materials, so those are, are consistent. Um, we are seeing a fair amount of storm damage repairs. 
but nothing huge. Um, we're hoping, you know, now that Florida City is going to start their second phase, I do have potential of a new commercial building going up. Um, so hopefully there's a few things coming down the pipe that will um, move that. And the minute I printed this, last week was crazy for building and zoning. Yeah. It was crazy. Um, so we probably reached over that 63 mark. But um, just wanted to give you kind of a snapshot of where we are in the building department um, on buildings. Um, just number of permits and valuations, um, outstanding inspections. We have a fair amount of outstanding inspections. A lot of them were extended through June 30th, and we have a fair amount extended through August 30th. So now we have to get um, back into the books and send those guys run it and say, are you ready for your final or you will, um, we will expire your permit? Because they've just been open too long without anything being done. And then I printed off the newsletter. Great. Got it. Do you have anything else you need to discuss for planning? Nope. Next okay. meeting. Um, and it looks like we will have the next meeting in August. Um, I do have a thing, there's some things in the work that are coming down that we will need to meet on. Okay. All right, thank you. Council, if you want to stick around, planning, thanks for joining us. You're welcome to stay. We're going to talk about THC. If you want to, you can. But you don't um, have to. So, I asked that this be added to our agenda tonight just to see if we want to start taking action on it. Uh, Look at the granny house. So, the state passed the law authorizing the sale of THC products and didn't really give us any guidance on how we regulate that. Uh, so the question that I raised a couple times in talking to Tarek and then again this morning at the department head meeting is, is this something where we can regulate through the use of like a sales permit like we do tobacco or licensure? Um, or is this something that we can tax um, like some places do for their food and liquor? Um, sent, this out, sent out this email, said we'd research it 30 minutes after I sent it out. The League of Minnesota City sent out a frequently asked question form that answered all of the questions. Yep. So, that was helpful. Good. Um, we cannot tax it. We can do a food and beverage tax, which would apply to all food and all beverage within the town. And according to the League, it's a little unclear if the food and beverage tax could even apply to the THC. But. We don't have a food and beverage tax. I'm not in favor of starting one. No. So I think the taxation question is just done. Yep. Uh, as far as regulating it like we would a tobacco or liquor license, the league says probably, but you have to make some really specific findings on why that regulation is necessary. Um, as I understand it, and Bill, perhaps you know and you are more familiar with this, but tobacco and alcohol are specifically authorized for licenses in the statute. Um, THC is not, but the council could make specific findings on why the THC edibles should be regulated and subject to licensure. And if we make those specific findings, then we should be able to require a license before they're sold within the city. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think you could license it like tobacco. I, I don't. I don't know, maybe. I mean, maybe you'd get a challenge to it. But to me, the the state gave no guidance. I mean, right now, right now, you can sell THC products out of a vending machine. I mean, there's no, there's nothing that says you can't. You know, it, it's sort of bizarre. I mean, yeah. You know, so it, you mean there's no right now? There is. Yeah. So I thought. But. Well, as far as like. Who can sell and where you can sell and, right. and stuff like that. None of there's no there's no restrictions on any is of there that. Uh, what about age to buy? Yeah, they yeah, have 21 the age. You gotta have yep. 20. Okay. These are for cigarettes now too, so. So you ball it, you can buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Just here. <barely. laughs> yes, I, I of course my internet is of course not working right now, but I was trying to pull up because there was a news article where the author of the bill, I believe, was talking about how um, that it would be under municipal control, but then it did not say anything about what that meant specifically. 
Well, and here's I think the, it's the FAQs to open up. So. Yeah. The fun thing about passing a bill without having a hearing on it mm -hmm. is that the legislature doesn't actually get to hear from the stakeholders how the proposed language would affect things. So they snuck it through. It got passed. It's done. Yeah. We can spend days talking about whether that was good or bad. Doesn't matter. We're here now. So I think the question is, is there a desire for the council to look at, I think, probably a THC ordinance like we have a liquor ordinance? And if so, then we should get drafting that sooner rather than later. Otherwise, uh, I think we do want an ordinance. <coughs> we want to do a license like we do tobacco mm -hmm. because we want to know who's selling it, who has it. Well, and we have to have specific findings on why it needs to be licensed. Um, and certainly, you know, we license <coughs> things like alcohol <coughs> legal for the last hundred years, um, or give or take, get a period of prohibition whenever that ended. Um, tobacco is heavily regulated. THC has deleterious effects, the extent of which the data are unclear, but uh, I think it is something that we would want to regulate within the city. I agree. Yep. We should look at it. <coughs> I think we need input from the, um, the social aspect of it. Yeah. What's that going to do to the police department yep. or to the residents in town, <coughs> the uh, people that have access to it? Um, are we going to want to regulate it or not regulated and have a bigger problem with the potential. So I think we should uh, have an ordinance on it, but also um, work through the legal aspect of it. And what probably asking um, Sturgis County Sheriff, Paul Wigner, uh, and maybe some of the officers that, that deal with regular uh, <coughs> THC illegal substances as of now, versus what's going to happen when it's not, is when it is um, legal. And also, what's that going to do to, towards uh, um, uh, operating a motor vehicle? Well, it, I mean, you know, I could try to answer that. I mean, you know, it, it's still illegal to operate when you're intoxicated. Yep. And so if you're, you know, so officers are going to have the ability, I mean, they're, you, you, I mean, you can buy this, I don't know, what is it, 50 milligrams in a package or something? Yes. I mean, I, I think that, you know, if, if somebody decided, and, and there's no limit on the number of packages you can buy. I mean, there there's a limit of what, what each, each gummy can contain, but you can buy a package that has 10, and you can theoretically buy 10 packages, so you've got 100 of them. And, you know, I mean, that's, I mean, I, I think like in Colorado, I think they're limited to 10 per gummy instead of five. So we're, we're, our limit per gummy is less, but we're not, I mean, you can have plenty of them. So you could be well under the influence, I'm sure, you know. Um, so it's, it's just gonna, it's gonna be a, it's not gonna be any different than now, you know, with people smoking or whatever, you know, that, that or that have gummies that were illegal gummies that had higher concentrations. The police run across this all the time, and they have to make judgments about whether people are under the influence or not. So it doesn't really change anything in that regard. I mean, it's just it's just that you've created more accessibility, uh, but it doesn't change from law enforcement's perspective, really. It says here the same process to determine sobriety as they abused if they suspected a driver was under the influence of marijuana. So I don't think it'll change. It doesn't well. change their job on driving. No, from law enforcement perspective, the only thing that really differentiates, and Bill, maybe your experience is different, but when I was doing it, with, an al with alcohol, you had a BAC. You know, you had your breath amount, or your whatever came back in the blood. Yeah. You're not gonna have a blood alcohol limit or a breath, you know, you're not gonna have that. So you have to look at what else the officer saw. Was there weaving, you know, speech impediments, things like that. Mm -hmm. You have to look at everything else and try to prove it out. Uh, it's, it's like an old fashioned, under the influence from the five yeah. days when that's all when that's all you have is the officer's testimony and yeah. I would like to see uh, as I understand from the league we can put a moratorium in place while we look at an ordinance 
Um, so my thought is we should probably look at a moratorium and then actively look at a licensure ordinance on this. Um, do, we, do we know that we already have somebody doing it? <laughs> I'm not aware of anyone. That's why I think if we do a moratorium now, I would guess the only thing that's holding up Casey's and Quick Trip from doing it is that it's working its way through the corporate bureaucracy. And that as soon as it gets through there, and as soon as they get some in, it's going to hit the shelves. The other, that's my guess. The other thing I heard it happened so fast that they don't have a supplies. Correct. Oh, yeah. That it was they weren't prepared for it. So no, this is made for him. Yes. Yes. Not for marijuana. Right. But it's yeah. no different. It's, 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 it's the same. It still puts you on a little trip to the It's the same THC. And it's not. I mean, Delta eats. But now it's not. But it, but now it's regulated. It never it never was regulated. Now it is. So this is Delta. I guess if we can do a moratorium, I have interest in at least discussing that further. Um, if that's something we can discuss at our Monday meeting. Great, I don't know if we have time to put that together. And then we can get an ordinance regulating it in more detail. I think it should be a license course. just like our tobacco. I agree. Yeah. And I have, I have a feeling that the league is gonna have a template for an ordinance probably within a week. I'm, I'm sure they're scrambling. <laughs> yeah, they are. Their phones are ringing off the hook, I'm sure. <laughs> well, they're, they're meeting on it. We is there a way other than the ordinance to specify that they have to be so many miles away from a school, whether it's elementary or high school? I would think so, because we can do that with our tobacco. We can do it with the liquor, too. Yeah, um, we can do it with liquor. I don't yeah. think we do it with tobacco, but, but yeah, we, we don't do it with tobacco. I don't know if it matters, but we can't sell it to them anyway. But again, I think it comes down to that's why we should look at a moratorium is we don't know so much of this. Can we? Uh, so if we can just pause all sales until we, you know, take two or three months to get a comprehensive ordinance in place. I have to look at whether, whether you can do, I mean. It says there's no clear opt-out. Right, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't know that you can do a moratorium. I, I think you can do a moratorium on land uses, but I don't know if you can do a moratorium on something that the state allows. My read of it was that we could. Okay. Uh, I haven't looked at that, and I, I'll take that to the work. Well, if the league is saying you can, maybe you can. I, I, it was at least a likely could, <laughs> if I recall. All right. So. My biggest worry would be uh, how would a three or four year old uh, differentiate a THC gummy versus a regular gummy? Well, it says in here that they can't, there's a lot of restrictions, like it can't be like look cartoony, it can't be marketed towards kids, it can't. But I mean, you know, we sell uh, alcoholic freezies at the liquor store. Yeah. You know, I mean, they it, could, it, it, it is, too, yeah. it is yeah. a danger, but I think it's, you know, that's the thing. If it, 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 it's a I don't think that's not something we can control. I don't think we need to make a moral judgment on something that the state has determined should be legal. I think we just need to look at what's going to be best for the regulation and for the city itself. So you're not wrong. In looking at the answer to the question on whether or not we can do a moratorium, uh, they say you know, yes if you're adopting future regulations, but then it refers to zoning issues. So I think it's basically saying you can use that opportunity to develop an ordinance that specifies where <coughs> you're going to permit the sale of THC products. But everything I've seen from the league is they're suggesting you not try to do it through zoning. They're saying do it as a licensing regimen, don't do it through zoning. So I, I don't, yeah. I'm going to send you this because you're going to laugh because it says both things in here. Okay. I suppose through zoning, it's a list under C1 or C2 of what you can do and what you can't do. A THC dispensary or store, and I suppose through licensing, like we have to go home to back with the other chapter 5B. Yeah, now something more we have to add to our zoning. <laughs> well, that would be one line item under where we're going to allow it. Are we ever going to get this done? No, it's getting done. It's going to be done this well, year. It's going to be done this year. It's going to be done this year. It's going to be done this year. That's not full yet, is it? It's full yeah. apart. <laughs> that thing is held together. You know, that thing is going to go in the historical yeah. society right here. You get it doing it. Yeah. No, we don't want it. <laughs>
Thank you, everybody, for your time. Yeah, at least it's air conditioning.